Hi, my name's Andrew Dudley and this is Earth Live, a webcast featuring interviews of people working on the front lines of conservation. For anyone that's been working in the conservation industry for the last 30 years, our next guest needs no introduction. Today we have the pleasure of speaking with Richard Donovan, who's joining us from Jericho and Vermont. Richard, welcome to Earth. Hey, thanks Andrew, good to be here. So what is it you do? How would you describe your work, Richard? I'm a, a natural resources generalist. I, I've spent uh, basically about 40 years of my life spending somewhere over 40, 50 percent of my time uh, traveling and, and a lot of time in, in developing countries. Worked in about 50 countries in tropical, temperate and boreal forests. Um, my first love, honestly, is being out in the field and either being a tree feller or actually uh, being a forest auditor. Um, those are two things that I just continue to love to do. Um, these days, I'm because I'm, I've had a lot of experience, I tend to get called in by people at, at, I'll just say, senior levels, like VPs and CEOs, to give them guidance on where to go in terms of a sustainable forest and forestry direction in general. I, I do dabble in agriculture, or a little bit more than dabble, but I'm primarily focused on forests and forestry. So when did you first realize you were going to devote your career to conservation? Mm -hmm. It's pretty funny, actually, because I, my, I have two grandfathers. One was a teacher, um, an Irish school principal in northern Minnesota, and the other one was a logger sawmill owner. And ironically, it was the teacher um, who, who affected me more in terms of the wood. Um, I went into Peace Corps in the, in the mid-70s, and I worked in, in in small communities, and this it'll, there's a circle here. And I, after about three years in, in Paraguay, South America, I came back and I decided I didn't want to work in water and sanitation, which is what most of my work was in, in Paraguay. But I, I began to learn about watersheds and forests and the value of, of them for water and for communities. And so I decided to come back to the States and I did my master's in natural resources management with a with a strong focus on on kind of hydrology and forests um and it was it was really literally right after peace Corps, i figured you know what i really like forests and um my dad was always was a big influence on me and he said you know do what you love um pursue pursue what really gets you going you know get your juices going because then at least when you get up in the morning you're not going to be asking yourself you know why am i doing what i'm doing um and i can honestly say for and my wife will testify to this that for for 40 years i i i, I may have had sleepless nights because of a particular job or something i was involved in but i never had a sleepless night caused by what the heck am i doing why am i doing it um that hasn't been my problem. I've had other challenges, but that, that's not one of them. So it, it hit me big time after Peace Corps. Uh, and ever since then, it's just been, I'd say, I've, as I said before, I've, I've dabbled in some other things, but for us, has been anywhere from 60 to 100% of what I've done at any one point in time. That sounds like sound advice from, you, from your granddad, for sure. Yeah, they're both, <laughs> both grandfathers, if they knew what I was doing today, they'd probably be proud. Um, and my dad certainly he's passed and 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 he was he was always proud um, mm -hmm. He didn't tell me just this is a little kind of a cute little thing is that my dad was uh, One of the you know, you know kind of one of those guys who was kind of the pride of northern Minnesota when he was growing up He was a very good student. He didn't tell me until he the day I graduated from college what his major in college was and it was Spanish <laughs> And dad never talked about that. He didn't want to dwell on him. He wanted you to live your life the way you should live it. Not, he didn't want you to live, he didn't want you to live for him. Um, and you know, it's odd, I'm one of seven kids. So it's not like we would have these long drawn out conversations every night. Um, you know, we had food fights and all those kinds of things. <laughs> um, but, but it's just, it's kind of instructive in the sense it, it stayed with me with my kids, I want them to do what turns them on, mm -hmm. not what turns me on. Um, if I get turned on in the meantime with what they're doing, hey, more power to me. Mm -hmm. That's great. So did you go to university? And if so, what did you study? And, and was, did that prepare you for the, for the life ahead? Yeah, I started at a, um, uh, believe it or not, in this body, I was at one point a, a long distance runner, a cross country runner, and I went undergraduate up in Indiana. Um, and then I, I had exhausted all the Spanish courses there. Originally, my 
major was going to be in Spanish and political science, and I thought about being a lawyer. Um, but then I, I, I got tired of the school I was going to. I moved. I actually studied in Mexico, and the, the, I got impassioned about history, Latin American history in particular. I learned Spanish and Portuguese, and I just learned a whole lot. Um, and when I, after, after undergraduate, I went into Peace Corps. Um, um, you're probably too young to remember this, but the 1970s and 80s in South America were about dictatorships. Um, dictatorships were more common than democracies. Um, and so I had democracies all around me when I was in Peace Corps. So my, my Latin American history, I ended up getting an undergraduate degree in Latin American history and romance languages, which you kind of like, well, now wait a minute, how does that take you towards forestry? Um, but what, what it did was it built under, in, in me an understanding of different ways of thinking about things. I see languages as, wi as windows into people, and I actually see dialects of languages, like somebody who's from the UK or someone who's from Australia. They speak a different kind of English than we Americans do. And I see those, those, the way that they do that as a window into a different way of seeing things, and that's what I got from undergraduate, was that perspective on understanding, trying to at least as much as I can understand other cultures. So I understand that you eventually ended up in Costa Rica, but could you tell us what your, your first job in conservation was and then the journey to uprooting the family and, and moving to Costa Rica? Yeah, when I finished undergraduate, I, I was a volunteer for something called the Alaska Coalition, um, which in the late 70s, um, I was part of an advocacy effort to create wilderness areas and, and indigenous lands in Alaska and elsewhere um, with the Audubon Society and the Alaska Coalition. Um, but I would say after graduate school, my first big job was with an international consulting firm and it was focused on forests and forestry primarily um, in Africa and Latin America was where most of that work took me at that point in time. And I spent a lot of time on the ground um, whenever I could. Um, and actually, the seven years of consulting was a little frustrating because I felt like I was doing too much desk work. And that's what led me to go to Costa Rica. Um, so I was offered a job to run, actually, Coast, uh, at that time, World Wildlife Funds, one of its first projects that, was, that actually involved on-the-ground forest management. Um, and one of, the, one of the moments in that process was when I was asked to come and meet with the board of directors. Um, because the people I was working with at World Wildlife Fund US said, we got to prepare the board of directors for something because there's, there's a chance that in the work that you're doing, you will actually be, there'll be chainsaws in the picture. There'll be people actually felling trees. And we felt at the time that that was going to be a pretty big leap of faith for WWF. Be thinking, uh-oh, they're actually felling trees. Um, and that went, it was, it was, successful in terms of at least opening up the window of what sustainable development looked like. It wasn't as purist as people would like to think it to be. Um, it wasn't all about conservation. Guess what? There are people out there and you got to work with the people. Um, so it really kind of was, it was something, it was, it was an intense three to four year period um, uh, working in a place called the Osa Peninsula of, of southwestern Costa Rica. If you've never been there, get there. It's one of the prettiest forests you'll ever see. And, and it was, it had it continued to have fundamental impact on me because we knew in order to conserve this park, which was at the center of it, Corcovado National Park, that we, yes, we wanted to do things good and, and support things in the park, but we had to somehow protect the buffer zone around it. And if we didn't do that, the park wildlife don't know you know they don't know boundaries um wildlife don't know uh what's one province versus another or one town versus another so if you don't figure out how to protect in and around these protected areas um you're not going to be successful so that's what our project was about um it, and it was towards the end of that where i got to meet reinforced alliance okay so and, and that's a uh, great segue into the next question. So we're gonna. So let's fast forward to 1992. So you know, looking back, there was there was no internet. Federal Express had just started. Fax <laughs> yeah. machines were relatively new. So what was that? You know, take us back to that period and you know that first meeting that you had with Daniel Katz, the co-founder of Rainforest Alliance. Yeah. So I was I was pretty darn lucky. Um, I consider myself an extremely lucky person in many ways. Um, I had met 
in Costa Rica, uh, Chris Willie and Diane Jukowski, uh, two longtime pioneers and 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 found co-founders of Rainforest Alliance, along with Daniel Katz, came down and visited me in, in the OSA. They had just started living in Costa Rica, where I think they ended up spending 15, almost 20 years. Um, but they came down and visited me. And Rainforest Alliance was pretty new then. It had been established in 87. So here I am doing this work with indigenous communities and local communities and the also they come down, I take them on a muddier than hell hike. <laughs> Up on the way back, it's a rainstorm and the mud is about a foot and a half th deep. Um, so if you didn't like mud, you're gonna have a problem right then and there. Um, we had, a bl I was having a blast. I was in my element and they could see that. But I could also, I learned, I got to, began to get a sense of what Rainforest Alliance was like them. And I guess you could say I put it in my mental filing cabinet because at that point in time, you know, I still, this is 88 and I'm gonna be there for another two, two and a half years. Um, when I came back to the US, um, a couple of organizations asked me to go to a meeting in Northampton, Massachusetts of something called, it's a great name, Woodworkers Alliance for Rainforest Protection, <laughs> WARP. Uh, and, and there they're having this discussion about the idea of certification and how to best organize it for success in the forestry sector. So I go to this, these other people ask me to go there. I meet a guy named Ivan Usach, um, who at that time was the head of the Smartwood program and the Timber Project at Rainforest Alliance, um, an environmental toxicologist. Um, and so I get to meet him. Fast forward 92, um, we've, we've begun to create the FSC, the Forest Stewardship Council, that came out of that meeting in Northampton. And, and Ivan says to me, hey, Richard, I need to do something different. You've got a lot of skills, you've got languages. Would you be interested in taking over my position? And I said, um, yeah, there's interest, let's, let's explore it. So then I go and I meet with Dan. And, and at that point, um, I think the office in, in, in New York was on uh, Lafayette Street uh, down in Soho. And, uh, and I go into the office and here's an office, it's, it's almost like a cavern. Um, and there are like four or five people staff in it, goes deep, um, and there's books, shelves on both sides, and everybody's desks are kind of on top of everybody. And here's Daniel, who's probably at least years younger. And he says, so what do you say? You want to join? Um, you, are you interested in, in being part of this? And I said, well, yeah, but I just so you know, I, if, if this means moving to New York, that's probably not in the cards. That's not something I'm going to do. Um, and he says, all right, well, we'll, we'll test this out. We'll see how it works. You know, as you said before, no FedEx or just or FedEx is just getting started. Mm -hmm. um, there's only fax machines. There's no Internet. Um, and so it's a work in progress. You know, I have a little tiny office in my little tiny house in Richmond, Vermont. Um, and from there, I, you know, fast forward 27 years later in 2019, um, uh, it's been an incredible journey um, with uh, tons of experience um, and, and the you know, one of the main products of it is this whole idea of certification, sustainability, auditing, all that, which becomes a foundation for, for, for accountability. You know, company wants to say it's doing it right, well, prove it. And, and that's what I spent most of those 27 years on. And so uh, Daniel Katz said the phrase to you, which is uh, it's so practical. <laughs> so it was, it was kind of fun because he, the way, and, and Daniel, even to this day, I still think he's, he thinks it's the best buzzwords for Rainforest Alliance, which is let's have programs, let's do initiatives that are so practical, they're radical. Um, and because as you know, a lot of people, when they think radical, they, oh, they mean radical greenies. No, no, no. This is meaning it's so practical, you can't avoid it. It's compelling. Um, and that's what makes it radical, that it's new ideas. And so throughout my tenure, I was lucky to have um, three different uh, presidents or directors of Rainforest Alliance that I reported to. Daniel for, for somewhere over 10 years, Tanzi Whalen um, for, I think, almost 15 years, and then Nigel Sizer for a couple of years. Um, and I finished up actually with a guy named Honda Groot and they were all great in that they said to me Please keep innovating. Please keep trying new things. They, they didn't put Boundaries in front of me and saying yeah, they they would put hurdles out there and say hey, you got to go out and raise money for this stuff um, Which I tried to do um, and I think it was mostly successful at maybe not always 
Um, but one of the things that happened was that we were able to create a lot of new things. We did a lot of innovation, um, which is probably beyond forests and family. Um, innovation is probably the thing I like the most. And what has changed over the years of Rainforest Alliance and, and what would you say are its biggest challenges moving ahead? Yeah, it's 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 a it's it's continues to grow as an organization. Um, I don't. I my guess is that the staff is somewhere around two fifty, maybe even three hundred uh, globally. Um, they're in a lot more places, and they've been in some of those places for over twenty five years. So you've got, I would call it a, um, uh, you know, kind of a, what you know, put them in age classes. They're not children anymore. Um, they're 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 not youths anymore, um, but they're not senior. They, so they've the organization and now has had to deal with that growth. Um, that brings makes it more of a management challenge. How do you manage these activities? And I would say foresters and environmentalists have not always been the best managers. Um, they oftentimes are a little bit scattered, or they don't manage a, a focus on budget enough or leadership development, et cetera. So I think that the whole management requirements of that kind of organization are much higher than they used to be. Um, we now have the, you know, two, I would say, you know, the challenge of, of probably the biggest challenge of the last, I don't know about the last 50 years, but certainly the last 25 years, which is climate change. And so they're trying to figure out how to deal with climate change. And as part of that, um, I've been, I've really taken on and focused on restoration because there are a lot of com companies, governments, even nonprofits who've made commitments to do restoration around the globe. And I've tried to help them. Um, I'm trying to guide them, even Rainforest Alliance, in going the right direction in terms of restoration and, and climate change. So I think the organization wrestles with how to evolve as an organization. So on the one hand, what you get is you're an organization that's learned a lot and feels like they have some good learned tools. But on the other hand, you want to say, well, I'm not going to take the, every tool I know and assume that it will stay static. You can't take the same thing you were doing five years ago and assume that that's going to be appropriate today. So it's just this constant. Um, what I love is um, I, I love competition when it's about ideas. I'm not so much a money guy. Um, dollars matter, of course, they always do. But I like the competition around ideas. And as I think you know, as well as anybody, you know, there's, there's, there's some people who say, well, that's what non for profits do. For profits and, and businesses compete. No, nonprofits compete also. But from my point of view, what they should be competing about is better ideas, better innovation, new things to do out there, um, and creative ways of doing things that haven't been done before. Um, so I think that's where, the, that, that's where Rainforest Alliance finds itself. Um, a lot of very sharp young staff, um, and as I was exiting my full-time role with Rainforest Alliance, a lot of my time was spent trying to be a good mentor, try, trying to help them evolve as professionals. Um, and, and now that my opportunities, you know, in a way are wider because I'm not on staff at Rainforest Alliance, I'm, a, I'm an independent forest advisor. So I'm trying to help other organizations. And sometimes the call comes to me because, hey, look, we got this young group of staff at our organization and we'd like you to help mentor them to on X, Y, and Z topic, uh, restoration being one of the big ones. But, and so that's kind of fun for me. You know, I love working with kids. They make me younger. They make me feel younger. Um, and I feel like as long as I'm practical um, and, I, and I don't lecture them, you know, there's a line between teaching um, and, and mentoring and lecturing. Um, I'm, not, I'm sure I crossed the line. There are times when I screwed up. Um, but the idea here is to just keep fostering things going in the right direction. And then, of course, we've got technological change, right? I mean, this, this, you know, this call that we're doing right now, um, as we've learned during the pandemic, um, the evolution of, of, of all the communication tools, it's just phenomenal. Um, I think it presents great opportunities. They're dangers. Um, and I'll be honest, I, uh, one, of the, one, um, one of the things that somebody said to me the other day, which made a lot of sense is, you can create communication th using these same tools. I don't know that you can create trust without doing face-to-face -face things. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're all kind of testing that in a way. I tend to believe it's probably true, 
because whenever I've had great, I've had many great conversations with CEOs of companies um, or, or the heads of NGOs and government. And it's one thing to talk to them on the phone and, and, and feel like you're on the same wavelength. It's another thing when you see them face to face. And if you have the same positive connection when you see them face to face, chances are something good's going to happen. But sometimes you have the good one on telephone or on you know a Skype or, or a Zoom or something, and then it falls flat on its face when you meet face to face. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is something to be said for the fact that there, we're, what we have learned, I think, in the last year is the value of that face-to-face. -face. You know, there's no substitute for it. That's how you and I first met. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was face-to-face. -face. Um, it wasn't a, it wasn't a Skype call. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's probably grabbing a beer somewhere, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think it was, and 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 I think that that's what creates. You know, you, you get a feel for what people are like, mm -hmm. and I and it's something that I can't put my fingers on. It. It's not palpable in a way. But it's there. It's yeah. different. Yeah, it's kind of like that transfer of empathy, isn't it? When you know that when you're next to someone, you can feel that you, that doesn't pass through on the electronics for sure. Yeah, and I, you know, one of the things you and I talked about, I actually thought about something before we talked, and that was one of the things you asked me was what books. At one point, you asked me what books influenced me. Mm -hmm. uh, what book? Okay, and I had three that I I thought <laughs> of, and I actually thought long and hard about this one. So I'll do it quick. One of them was something called The Hundred Years of Solitude, Cien Años de Soledad, which is written by a guy named uh, Garcia Gabriel Marquez from Colombia. And it's, it's, a, it's kind of a different kind of novel because it's in this movement called magical realism, where it's kind of history based, but it's not. It, there's fiction to it. The second book is Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, <laughs> which is a very personal study of a man going across the country on his motorcycle. Um, and the third is a classic short story, short book, um, which is Old Man and the Sea by Hemingway. Um, I, I like them. I reread them um, because I just they, they just seem to have some good stuff in them that kind of just reinforces values. Um, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance talks about quality. Um, and I think that that's something that I think in your work you try to focus on. And it's something anybody who's doing something should do it with quality. They should do it with a feeling that there's, there's a, a foundation of quality behind it. Um, so that's what I gleaned from that book. So there you go. I gave you, gave you the book thing. I thought that might be fun. <laughs> no, thanks, Richard. And you know, you mentioned the Forest Stewardship Council before you were involved at the, at the beginning. Yeah. You know, how, how has that organization got on and what would you say their challenges are as well moving forward? Well, it's, it's pretty amazing. And I'm, I'm quite often asked as one of the founders of the organization, did I ever think it would accomplish with what it has accomplished? Um, and I look at that from two angles. In forestry and forests, I actually had hopes that it might accomplish, which it's now in like over 150 countries, um, mi millions, hundreds of millions of, of hectares or acres of forest involved, and more than 40, 50,000 companies around the globe. So, so it's had an impact on you know, fostering sustainability amongst those companies. But the other thing that it's done is it's set up a model a model is the wrong word because that implies that you can just flip a switch, put in place a model, and it works. And I don't agree with that. I think that there's always challenges and nuances to any kind of particular example. But what it did do was show, hey, we'll write a standard. We won't, we'll try to make that a practical standard. So when somebody asks about the sustainability of oil palm or the sustainability of cotton or the response, what is responsible production of petrochemicals? Hey, write a standard and audit to that standard. It's not going to be perfect. Nothing. There ain't no perfect solution to anything, as far as, as far as I can tell. But but what it created was this sense of evidence and forensic auditing and that and and the idea that you know this doesn't have to be just pie in the sky mumbo jumbo about commitments and about what people say. No, what matters is what they do. Um, and. And so I think that it's had an impact beyond the forestry sector, which is to say, here's how you go evaluate sustainability at the field level. Um, and what's fun about that is that just 
that makes it easy for me because I'm not as smart as some other people are. I'm, I, I like to be out in the field. I like to see things in the field. And that's why the, the FSC being very field focused has always felt very comfortable to me because I, it, when, you know, you'll, you'll talk about a particular issue like free prior and informed consent or human rights or, or, or living wage. Well, if I'm in a local community and I can see that that family is living in a destitute fashion, well, that's pretty darn clear something needs to change and and it may be that a standard can can help that but it's being on the ground seeing it that makes the difference and that's where we have said it's not enough to make all these commitments around sustainability or renewability you got to prove it um and that's a real comfortable space for me because i like people you know and i think it goes back to my my father my grandparents um, they were all pretty kind of straightforward people. They, they didn't, you know, if you said what you were going to do, you did it. Um, or you tried to do it. Um, and, you know, yeah, you're going to stumble. That's life. But, but at least be straight, be true to your values. Um, and so it's been fun because the kids um, have, have kind of evolved that way too. I think they're both honest. I think they're both hardworking. Um, that comes not just from me, that comes from my wife, too, because Karen has been a very hard worker her whole professional life. Brilliant. And so you've, you've got to travel this planet quite extensively. Do you have a favorite place that's really close to your heart? Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, I, I will answer it, but that's a real tough one. Um, I have a, a kind of a top of the list. I'm always going to say northern Minnesota. Um, I'm always going to say I want to go back there, be there, etc., because that's just where my heart and and I love the forest there, and I just I feel whole when I'm there, um, as I do here in Vermont, by the way. But other places that I think are really interesting, uh, Bhutan, is is just a mind bender because it's a country that is not in the mainstream on a whole bunch of things, um, and 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 geographically, it's just a gorgeous place. I mean, it's a tough place to travel because there's, I don't think you ever travel the whole country and go more than 30 miles an hour because of all the squiggly roads. Um, but it's a really interesting, it's Buddhist. Um, so you learn a different kind of way of looking at life. Um, I love Chile. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a gorgeous country. It's a mix of different cultures. Um, and, and, it, and I, every time I go there, I learn something more. Um, and, and I've always enjoyed I, I got to say, if I had another lifetime, I'd learn another five to ten languages because I find languages to be a window into understanding people. Mm -hmm. And every time, if I go to a place where I don't speak the language, I just feel so bad. It just, it just doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. um, and I, so I think getting long-term experience for people is a really important thing. And it's something I, my, both my kids speak Spanish. Drew speaks it, my son speaks it with a Vermont accent, which is pretty funny. Um, my daughter speaks it, it was her first fluent language. So she actually speaks beautiful Spanish, better than mine. Um, so I think these are, these are things, you, you know, the, the thing that I would say about going to other countries is to try to read, and which is easier today than it's ever been. It's easier to both get background information and to go places than it's ever been. And then try to just understand people. Get to get out and 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 see people and be with people in their element. Try to understand what drives their values and what's most important to them. Um, so, I, so when it comes to favorite countries, it's kind of hard because, mm -hmm. you know, I also like Brazil. Portuguese that is a beautiful language. I like Portugal. Beautiful language. Mm -hmm. And the people. Brazil is a very diverse place. So you've got indigenous groups, you've got blacks, you've got whites, you've got Caribbeans, etc. So it's just a really diverse place um, and, and one of the most diverse countries in the world. Um, so it has some real interesting parts to it. And of course, it's got the Amazon forest and, and the Cerrado, the dry forest, um, which are two incredible ecosystems. Um, they're huge, enormous and challenging. I was going to ask you as well, um, you know, over your career, you, you've met indigenous communities. Has there been one encounter that you've had that's really stuck out? And what did you take away from that experience? Yeah, there's been, I've had a negative and I've had a positive experience that both, both stick out. Um, I'll start with the positive. So I was a Peace Corps volunteer and I was asked to go help with one of my best buddies, a guy named Jeff Pine, 
um, to go up to the Chaco, uh, the northern part of Paraguay or western part of Paraguay, to to go to a community and provide them some support. These were communities, indigenous communities, which traditionally, historically, had been nomadic. Um, so they moved around, and they were settling into certain areas for the first time in the history of their tribes. And so they had never done latrines before. They had never had to worry about that because they were always moving on the landscape. Um, and the diet was things that, you know, most people probably wouldn't eat. Um, and Jeff and I just had this, we, we were the whole time we were, we, though we were there to help them, we were learning as much as we were helping. And in, in fact, I think we learned more than we helped. So that was a very positive experience because we spoke good Guarani, both of us, and we could talk to them Guarani and, and get into how their, their mind, their, the way that their mind worked. The negative experience was again in Paraguay, foundational for me, because um, there was an international human rights lawyer from the United States who went to Paraguay, um, and Paraguay was a dictatorship at the time. Let's not split hairs. It was a, not a good situation for indigenous people in Paraguay. Um, the actual Indian offices, quote unquote indigenous offices, were in the Department of Defense. <laughs> and you had generals, military people being in charge of it. So this guy came down and with the idea, the U.S. government invited him to look at what was going on with the indigenous communities and to do a report to Congress. This was during the presidency of Jimmy Carter way back in the late 70s. Well, I went out in the field with him. We saw a bunch of things. And then afterwards, I saw his report. And his report was flatly false. And I said, what is going on? Why is this? Here was somebody who, in theory, was an advocate for indigenous people. And he wrote a report which was littered with falsehoods. It affected me in the sense of saying, when, as I go forward, even today, when somebody says, well, I work for the indigenous people of X, Y, and Z. Just saying that isn't enough to me. I want to understand what is it the role you play, what's your links to them, what's your history with them. And I have to say that over the years that it has taught me that whatever someone's political inclinations are, whatever their religious implications are um, or values, um, the fact that I may share um, certain values with them as a person, and they may be completely different from me politically or religiously. Uh, that's not the basis upon which I should be evaluating them. I should be evaluating them based on what they do and how they perform. So when they commit to doing, for example, helping local communities, what matters is whether they do that or not, not whether it is a Mormon, uh, uh, you know, missionary who I might disagree with on the religious front. No, that's not what matters. What matters is what they actually do. So that was kind of foundational for me. This happened back in 1977. So here, I, here we are, however many years later, and I still remember it. I can still remember going into the communities with that person to visit those sites. And um, what he wrote afterwards and he sent to, to the U.S. Congress as a report was a fabrication. And I, so it, it, it just... It kind of takes me, if you fast forward to why I'm a forest auditor, because I want to get at what's really true about something. I don't want to be living in, in a fiction. Uh, I want to make sure that what people say is what they do. Um, and, and I think that that's, it, I guess it's, you know, I have the sense with you, you're the same way. You care about what people do. Um, and, and as much as it's nice to hear flowery language and, <laughs> and nice proclamations, Ultimately, what matters is what people do, not what they say. Absolutely. Now, you've had a long association with Costa Rica. What's your thoughts on what they've achieved with forest restoration? And, and could that be a, a blueprint for other countries to follow? You know, it's kind of interesting. When I, so when I left Costa Rica, I lived there. I first started working there in 1978, but I left, lived there from, from 80, what is it, 87 to 90. 1990. And when I left there, it was still in the midst of a major deforestation trend. There was a lot of subsidies for cattle. There were subsidies for clearing land and putting in tree plantations, um, etc. So it was a negative dynamic, but the beginnings of an incredibly exciting way of looking at natural resources was just happening. A new system of natural areas and all that kind of stuff. That was literally just starting when I was there. Um, under under the Figueres government. Um, and then what happened was that they, 
pulled the rug out from under the negative subsidies. So they took the subsidies away that fostered deforestation. And they started to say, well, if we're going to use subsidies and incentives, let's use them for positive things a lot with the, in terms of the environment. That's, so what that kind of says to me about the evolution of Costa Rica is, and the learning I get from that is, if government makes the decision to make fundamental change, it's huge. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't, and that goes in the flies in the face of some people today saying, well, the answer is always in the private sector. Well, I don't really think that that's necessarily true. Um, the other thing is that it has demonstrated, um, I don't think that the forest that was there and was lost, um, that you just fast forward and automatically get that back. I, th I think that it's a different kind of forest that comes up, but there are people like Brian Finnegan at Katia in Central America and others who've examined what happens when forest naturally regoes, regrows, what some people call assisted natural regeneration or just regeneration. It's amazing how forests can recover. But don't mistake that for saying, well, we don't have to worry about what we lose today because we can always grow it back. No, no, no. A lot of the forests that are being lost today are of such a unique nature, we should not be losing them because to recreate them, A, that may not even be possible because of climate change, um, and B, it's going to take a long, bloody time. And do we want our kids to inherit an earth in which they can't see those kinds of forests? Um, so. I think Costa Rica is a great example of a whole bunch of things. Um, it's been democracy in action from the get-go um, for, for a long time now. Um, and, and it's also of a community that's been positively, there's a, they created laws that fostered immigration, that fostered people retiring there. And it was, I think, one of the smartest things that they ever did, at least from where I sit, because they were able to bring in people with new ideas from other countries. And that has improved their country. Um, an analogous situation is I heard someone just the other day, we're talking about where the vaccines are coming from. Here in the United States and here in the world, the Pfizer and the Moderna, you know, just tying it in today. And what's striking is they say that somewhere uh, as much as 50% of the scientists who worked on those vaccines were immigrants, first or second generation immigrants. Well, doesn't that say something different about how we should think about immigration, that that if people are going to have the uh, courage to emigrate, to leave a situation where they can't survive, or there's you know women that are being discriminated against, etc., that takes a tremendous amount of courage, and so they're willing to do something different. Um, so I'm a, a big fan of 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 that kind of interchange and getting to know other cultures because they all bring different values to the table. Um, and I think Costa Rica is gained by it. I'm sure that there's negative aspects to immigration perceived by some people, by the Ticos, by some people in Costa Rica. Um, but by and large, I think it's been one of the positive things that has happened there. And so you've been recently working on a new global standard for forest ecosystem restoration. How, how has that been going and how has your experience in Costa Rica influenced that? Yeah, so this goes along the lines of we shouldn't do today what we did 25 years ago. We, we should learn from our experience in 25 and not commit the same mistakes over and over again, right? So we, uh, in the FSC system, we created uh, the principles and criteria of sustainable forest management, and then we created auditing indicators. So just this is just one ex concrete example we decided to forego the whole discussion of principles and criteria and go straight at the in field indicators, the auditors, what the auditors use in the field. Why? Because we felt that there's a lot of principles and criteria docs out there, documents out there, but we could go straight to something which is more focused on what actually needs to be audited in the field. Um, the response to that, we've gone now through two rounds of consultation. One of those was a private round with scientists and practitioners, the second round was public, and we're gonna do a third round before we're done with it. Um, and they've reinforced the model. They said, yep, be practical. We need you to be practical. We need to learn from what's happened in the last 25 years and all these auditing and certification systems. Well, and the other thing we said was, this isn't just about certification. Maybe this standard will be used in certification programs, maybe not. Maybe it'll be used what we call in first, second, and third party formats. 
Third party is more like certification. But first and second party are, first party means I'm auditing myself. Second party, I bring in a consultant. And they can also help me change the systems. Third party is it's completely independent. We have said from the get-go, this shouldn't be about just certification. This should be about accountability, whether it's done first, second, or third party. So it seems to be going a good direction. We got field tests we're gonna be doing in, in places like Spain and France and Costa Rica and Brazil and it's and Bolivia, etc., um, to, to kind of see where we end up on it. We just want it to be a contribution because I want all those commitments that people have made around restoration and as part of the climate change puzzle to be successful. If restoration is successful, it's better for you, me, and our kids. Um, and that's what matters. And, and for all the kids in, in all these countries, it's going to create jobs, it's going to improve the environment, and it's going to create social value as well. Because, you know, one of the things, and you've probably seen this in your travel, is that when people go, you know, they don't just, forests are a funny thing. They really provoke emotion, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and I, I figured that out. I think I really figured that out about 10 years ago. That I was trying to figure out why do people get so bloody emotional and fight so much over forests? It's because they care. And so you now have people that care about forests, not because they're going to get any wood out of it, not because there's going to be some other value. They may just want it as a place to be, you know, as a place to be spiritual um, because there's cultural heritage there. So I, I think one of the things we've learned over the years is to be more understanding of the broad values associated with forests and recognize that in every situation there's a different reason why people love forests. And we have to recognize that and we have to work with local people to take their values and and, and, and conserve or restore for us with those values in mind. Because if we don't, they will be destructive of what um, I think that's the experience we know we have had um, that's out there. And when you look back over your career, Richard, could you tell us what your proudest accomplishment has been? Well, you know, like every parent, you should always say, I'll say my kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my daughter Emily works at Rainforest Alliance, and my my son is a carpenter, a a, a builder, um, with two great professions. You know, so you got to be good about that. Um, I would say it's the community of people that I've interacted with, and a feeling that we are, we have become a big cruise ship, that you or a big t tanker that you can't. You're not going to, you might be able to tweak our direction five or 10 degrees one way or the other, but you know what? That tanker of sustainability folks, they're not giving up. They're, they're on it. They're, they're not going to, they're going to respect communities. They're going to respect indigenous peoples. They're going to create new renewable solutions, not just sustainable, but in particular renewable solutions. And I think that's, it's the community of practice that I feel the best about. Um, Organizations like the Forest Stewardship Council, like the Forest Guild, mm -hmm. um, you know, th those are organizations that I feel um, I, I, you know, today, these days I support the Rails to Trails Conservancy because these are communities of practice of people that are moving the world in a better direction. You're part of that community. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that's what I feel the proudest about um, and that I was always true to my my values and my roots, at least so far. I may screw it up. I still got some years to screw it up, but you know, you just, it, it, isn't it fun? <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's so fun to work in the woods. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I'm sure we'll get more opportunities. We'll be in the woods together. Yeah. And I think I may not know a damn thing about the forest I'm in, but I still like being there mm -hmm. um, because I'll learn from the people around me. Um, and the world has really gotten smaller in that regard. You know, somebody can say to me, hey, Richard, what do you know about the forests of Madagascar? And I'll say, eh, haven't been there, don't know so much, but I'm one or two degrees of separation from knowing the people that know the most mm -hmm. about those forests, particularly with the communication methods we have at our, at our behest now compared to where we were 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's that community of practice which is committed to not just environmental stuff but also social values and, and family and community 
I think that's what I'm proudest about. And I, and the, the journey doesn't stop. You know, I keep, you know, I'm, I'm still working about 50%. My wife says, why are you down in that basement in that working? What, you're not just working 50. I'm, well, what can I say? I like what I'm doing. I'm sure, you, you know, if there's one thing COVID has taught us, it's that we can be contributing as we're, you know, sitting in these strange places. Mm -hmm. um, as long as we just keep focused, you know, just we got to get to a better place. Absolutely. And just in closing, you, you mentioned your daughter has, has kind of followed in your footsteps. What advice would you give a young person that's seeking a career in conservation? Oh, boy. There, there are two that are really easy. Um, one is go live in another country, walk in someone else's footsteps with a different language, learn another language. Don't do that in a, for just a week or two. Do that for months, to maybe even a couple years, but do get out there and get that feel because if it doesn't bend your mind, it means you're not being open enough and you need to bend your mind. Um, so it's language and it's field experience, right? Getting out there and do it while you're young because it's that's when it's easiest, believe me. Um, and the, the third thing is to, um, some people don't, like this but i still feel do what you're passionate about because then you're not going to wake up at night saying what the heck am i doing why am i doing this at least you'll know mm -hmm. that you've followed pursued something that you love now you may fail and you may have to try something else but my guess is there'll be something good that comes out of that um so i, I guess it's those three things Exper field experience language and passion brilliant Follow <laughs> and just in uh, any closing remarks and um, perhaps in light of 2020 and what that's taught us that you'd like to make oh I, you know I like interacting with you because I think you open your mind to other kinds of solutions that are out there and you're not fixed on a single one that's going to make the change happen um and I, that's how I feel about all these issues in general anyway. And please, people, don't be dogmatic. Be open to new ideas. Um, one, you know, don't take the easy solution or easy answer, because chances are that there's layers of that onion, of that easy solution, which will make it more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and so question dogma. Um, be respectful, but question authority. Um, those those are a couple things that I think might help people. Um, and then just just be open minded. Mm -hmm. Richard, this has been a fascinating interview. So thank you so much for your time, and uh, the best of luck in retirement or semi retirement. Yeah, we'll see. And it, 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 there'll be a point in which I'm sure I'll feel people will say uh, they won't they won't keep calling me. <laughs> I think that's not that far away. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> They're calling me that much, Andrew. Uh, but I'm sure there'll be at a point where I don't think his synapses are connecting like they used to. <laughs> All right, mate. Well, hopefully that's far, far away because we, we need your you know dedication right. and passion. We'll see what happens. Yeah. But Take uh, great. This has been a fun opportunity. Um, happy holidays to you and your family. Yeah, and you, sir. All and right. uh, we'll be we'll be working together going forward, so it's going to be fun. Yeah, absolutely. Take care now. All right, cheers. Bye Peace. Bye. My name's Kirsty. If you enjoyed the content today and would like to watch more videos like this, please subscribe to our social media channels or join us at www.f.live/join.